what I thought we would do is, you know, between the guided meditation and the silence and the guided meditation is, uh, you know, open up a space for conversation and that instead of it just being Gary and myself engaging in this uh, spontaneous dialogue, which I, I really love to like, point back at what words, quote, originally meant, and dialogue just means speaking through. So uh, what we thought we would do is just ask you guys for questions and then, you know, as the spirit so moves us, have a go on to the next question and so on for about 45 minutes. Uh, so out of the silence, maybe a question will emerge. At what point do your insecurities feign intuition? They pretend to be like your internal guidance yeah. uh, voice. So, right, so the question is, at what point do insecurities uh, pretend to be intuition, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, from the very start. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> that... Uh, you know, one of the most amazing things that you may be experiencing is that you start to notice all of the things that your internal voice are saying to you, about you, all in the guise of being you. But in fact, the fact that you can observe that internal voice suggests that it's not you, it's not simply you. So, uh, once you encounter the fact that uh, this is not your true, authentic self speaking to you. Um, you can start to be with the things that it's saying. Like, you know, I don't know, uh, why do you have to eat so many Fruit Loops? Or, you know, the, the absurd <laughs> things, which if you pay attention, it does say, right? Mm -hmm. The most absurd, worst stand-up comic in the world resides, you know, bet uh, between your shoulders. Uh, and then, but what's interesting is then you just kind of abide that voice and you see it, it for its absurdity that it is. And that does open up your intu intuition. Once you let yourself just be with the absurdity of the voice, truth starts to manifest a lot more and intuition, I, I think you're speaking of, manifests. Does that accord with the Yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm big into feeling to me my whole spiritual process is a tactile process. I develop a feel for things. And that's how I guide what questions I use and how long I use them. They feel one way if they're working, some other way if they're not working. And for me, intuition versus, you know, whatever, insecurities feel very different. I mean, real intuition comes from down here and it feels totally different than uh, up here talking about all the problems can really feel the difference in those two, so you can discern which way it's coming from. Uh, Adyashanti had a good thing on this, on choices. You know, you can try to use your intuition to make your choices for you. And if you get a choice comes up, you can say, okay, it's going to be this or this. And one voice comes in and says, oh, it should go, we should go left. And you say, well, why should I go left? It'll come up with all kinds of reasons why you should go left. It's this, it's closer, the sun's out, blah, 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 blah. That's not the answer. If you ask the question, you know, why should I go left or right, then it says nothing. There's no response. There's no arguing. There's no comment. It's just, that's the answer. You just turn right. That's it. And that's the answer. You can feel how different those feel. The one that goes blah, 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 and the one that just says go right. And so you can get the feel for those things. Use this feeling as much as you can in your process to get a real sense of what's going on because in the end, You'll be doing your own process. It's DIY, and so you have to get a feel for what's working, what's not working, and how things are advancing. And it's really beautiful what Gary's describing this this process of apparent choice because you can start it with very trivial things, like in, in the morning there are socks. Which socks am I going to wear exactly? <laughs> Which socks am I going to wear? And I can just watch as the choice happens. It's not even that I ask, you know, oh, should I have this one or should I have this one? I just observe, 
that the sock that was going to be pulled from the drawer is pulled from the drawer. And that's why there's no mouthing off from the intuition, because it has nothing to say, because it knows it's just going to happen. So it's, I think what your question is a great one, because we fall into the habit of thinking that that's our true self. Uh, and we're right to think that we do have intuition that can guide us, but it's not that. And the intuition may just be, we had this metaphor of a rider and an elephant. I mean, the rider is a little blah, 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 blah. But the elephant is the enormous, massive, parallel offline processor, data storage, under the universe. And so the intuition may be coming from the universe or coming from the elephant, but it's clearly not coming from the rider. And that's what you look for. And Rich had a great point on just picking out your socks. Don't try to lift a 700,000 pound dumbbell. I mean, just go out and do something simple, something like pick out your tea for the day and just see how that works out. And often you can get that feel worked into yourself get a sense of it. If you try to say, well, should I get divorced or not, there's going to be all kinds of stories going on up here. And to get past that into this feeling is easier if you've done a lot of practice on what this feeling feels like to make these very simple choices. The practicing the feeling then means the feeling starts to manifest itself in those bigger choices. But really practicing on quote unquote mundane, meaningless things is, and it's fun too. It's an adventure because you go, ah, Really? That one? All right. <laughs> tea in the morning. And I look at my six, eight kinds of tea. And I just stand there. And I just wait. And then pretty soon, an energy will move to, okay, this is the tea for today. And it's just, just give yourself the permission to just stand there without the answer and wait for the answer to come up. As you get into this work more and more, you find that's what you really have to learn how to do is trust that intuition is going to come in and give you the decision. Even working in your complex corporate jobs, you find the same thing. And you read the exhibits before the meeting, discussion takes place, and you just sit there. And you just wait and wait until something comes up from down here that has that feeling to it, and all you have to do is just say it. It turns out to be OMG type you know, information. So just learn how to trust it. And this point of riches is just, you know, just get a trust for it. Just learn it. You can trust it. Learn how to listen and wait for the answer. Don't rush it. Just sit there and be present with no answer until it comes up. Right, so, you know, Yogi Berra, the late sage from the New York Yankees, he said you can learn a lot by just, you can, uh, you can observe a lot by just watching. <laughs> so the practice is to just constantly be in observational mode. You say, well, which pair of socks am I going to cho choose? I can't wait to find out who's going to do this. <laughs> so, and, and it's very funny because it, it, what it brings to you, too, is this spot of not knowing. You, you realize that, it, that in your life, you're always in this point where you actually don't know what is about to occur. And that's what's interesting and exciting about it. So I'll give you a very quick example about just how powerful this is. Uh, I told Gary this yesterday. I, I went to uh, Moscow recently on a trip, and I was exhausted. And I got into the hotel and I asked the guy, oh, is it all right to tell us? Yeah, no, no. And, and, uh, and I went to the hotel and, you know, I, didn't speak, I don't speak any Russian. The guy didn't really speak much English. Could have used you. you know, like, and I, I understood that he said, okay, you can go left or you can go right on the main street and you'll find something to eat. Right? So I went out, it was 17 degrees, I go left, I'm walking, maybe this one, you know, and, it's, and the folks, the oh, the fish could be really good. You know, like, the internal intuition was speaking, but no, no, this one, no, no, this one. I keep going back, no, not that one. You know, I'm, and I'm hungry. Why, why do I keep moving on? Just eat something. <laughs> I go further down the street and I go, it's not even a question of going into this one. I go into this one, I sit down, I work out with a woman who's working there because she gives me an English uh, menu, but she can't read the English menu. <laughs> and, it's diff and it's different than the Russian menu, right? So I'm just going through this in total non-knowing, ignorance. And while we're working out, a man comes over, and I think, oh, he's going to help us translate. And he comes over, and he's looking at me with incredulity. He says, Richard Doyle? Are you Richard Doyle? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, I'm Dmitry Bulatov. This is the guy who had invited me to Moscow of all of the restaurants that I had manifested you know, that I could have manifested in, in Moscow, you know, within a several mile radius of my hotel, I get to this restaurant and there's the guy who's looking for me, right? So if you just let yourself 
be pulled along with what's going to pull you along anyway. Instead of that horrible feeling like, well, I don't know, maybe the fish was better in that place, you know? Because that's what it feels like, right? You're pulled in multiple directions at the same time. Let go, and what is going to occur is going to occur. So when you find a fork in the road, take it? Another Yogi Berra, yes. <laughs> but I think that trial and error is good because like sometimes I'm in the morning and as I'm trying to get my day started, like the first example that came to mind is that I look at my closet, I know what shirt I'm going to wear. Yet I have like moments where I'm like changing my shirt five times and then I end up with a shirt that I wanted to wear in the first place. So, th and that feels good, but that's okay. And then you make the mistake where you don't do that or you don't eat what you wanted from the menu at the restaurant and then you're like, oh, I should have gone with my intuition. So afterwards it might feel like you might retroactively know what your intuition was telling you. So you have further confirmation that next time you go, you listen to that to that voice. So something else Rich touched on here is these serendipities. And when I page turned for me and the thoughts of blah 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 blah. Um, it was like I, I didn't need God, I mean, I, I, my life was running fine all by itself without me. It actually ran better without me than it did before. But I kept seeing these things like we're just talking about, these astonishing serendipities. Now, what is the probability that that guy would be in that restaurant at that time to meet his rich exactly that moment? Infinitesimal. If you watch, the quieter you get, you can see them more clearly. You can just watch for these and say, look at this, we did this thing on Thursday night, look at this gathering. How many things had to take place for all these people to be in this room at this time in this place? I mean, if you go back to any of your great, 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 great grandparents and they, something else different had happened in their life that much, you wouldn't be here today. So, my life is completely, I think you're all of it, serendipitous. You see all these completely low probability, very fortuitous, propitious events occurring, and you have no idea how they happened. They just come into being. So to me, that pushed me into who's doing this? Because whatever it is, it's way smarter than I am. And whatever it is, you know, she, I call it she, she has more bells and whistles to pull than I can pull because she can get things orchestrated and pulled together that I could never even fantasize about. So to me, that's the biggest confirmation I've gotten that there is something running this whole process is because I can't make those things happen. I see them all the time. So relax, you're not doing it. <laughs> Relax, the sock will be chosen. <laughs> Do you apply that to like every facet of your life or is it just like... Because for me, I feel like I'd stand in front of my dresser naked for like six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Only one way to find out, Grant. <laughs> and by then, you may be married. <laughs> Gotta have lunch first. You know? um, it really, I know it seems like that. So let's, let's work with that because that's, your mind comes in and abstracts and says, I know what this is going to be like. I'm going to stand naked in front of my dresser for six hours, right? But in fact, that's not what happens. You uh, uh, open yourself, you surrender yourself to the process, and the process unfolds. Now, there's some infinitesimal chance that maybe that means you stand naked in front of the dresser for six hours. But if so, that's performance art, and you could probably, you know, get a PhD for it. <laughs> it's, just fun, it's just fun to try that. Yeah. You say, I'm going to stay in bed all day today. Yeah, I'll give it a try. You just lay in bed and say, I'm not going to get up today, and just see what happens. And if you step back and just watch that non-judgmentally, you will see yourself getting up, getting out of the bed, starting to go through your day. It happens automatically. When you think you've resolved you're not going to do that, I will not take this test that you find yourself taking. I will not do this that you find yourself doing it. You can actually step back and kind of watch yourself like a character in a play. Doing this thing, it's like, what the hell's he up to now? <laughs> you find yourself doing these things out of amazement. You just detach from that. You can see life runs itself much better than I could run my life. So yes, absolutely all of it. All of it. It's like that. And, and I thought it would be a scary place. I was very deterministic. Yeah. And I was sure I had made all the things that happened in my life happen as they were or failed to help make, make them happen. From the turn, I could see I had never been in control. I had never had free will. And it was running very perfectly, thank you very much, all by itself. And so I just let go completely. 
I have no sense of even whether I whether I did this. Both Einstein and Martin Maharshi gave the same answer to this thing. Martin Maharshi was asked, "Is this is even this predetermined?" He says, "Yes, even that. It's predetermined because you never know when this thing will be important. This might be a very important thing. We just delayed the universe by one half of a second. I just never know." Another way to feel that too is to say, like, if you feel like you have this feeling of control, and most of us do, you can feel that feeling of control and just really be with it. As Gary's saying, it's very tactile. You can feel it. It's like, what does that feel like? Then? I know. You know. He decided to pick up that cup. You know. Uh, you feel that feeling of control, and can you avoid that feeling of control? Is can you control control, <laughs> or is that just something which overtakes you? This feeling of control, this impression of control, this impression of free will. Is that something that you freely choose? Or is it something that is just unfolding like the choosing of the sock? And when you let it just unfold, it feels different. It doesn't feel like you're in control. It feels like I'm part of some massive interconnected energy dance. <laughs> What's going to happen in it next? Amazing that I get to see this, basically. You know, we're a fascinating juncture now on no on free will. I mean, neuroscientifically, we can prove it. there isn't any free will. There's tons of research on this. Videos I can send to you, whatever you want to see. Go my blog post, there's lots of stuff. The question now is, why did we develop this sense of free will? I mean, it must have been some, some way Darwinianly useful, evolutionarily useful, to have this, um, this impression of having free will. When in fact, it's not the truth. I mean, did it benefit our species? And it's still benefiting our species to believe that. If you look at the underlayment in the justice system, in the religious system, they all presuppose free will. Without free will, the churches really don't have much to go on. The justice system is saying, what? With no free will, you get a whole different game in the justice system. And we, we know it isn't real. And some attorneys are now, defense attorneys, are seizing on this and saying, hey, look, you know, we have this neuroscience, it's no free will. You know, he didn't do it of his own free will. Some places it plays, some places it doesn't play. But it's now coming into the mainstream. And if you try to guess how it's going to roll out forward, it's not pretty. I mean, you know, I don't know how they're going to in in include that into our institutions, into our justice system, into the religions, because it's really a revolutionary concept. Like, you know, the Earth is not the center of the universe. And the Earth is not flat people. And some people were saying, well, just don't tell them. There was a study, a study came out and said, okay, the people, just if you tell them they have free will, they'll behave better. I don't think that's, I don't think that's correct. I mean, we are Darwinianly encoded to behave a certain way. Almost all the religions have exactly the same codes because that's exactly what we've evolved into. We don't need a code of ethics to behave. We behave naturally for the most part. That's already in there. This whole thing about free will, it's, it's unraveling. Question of how it unravels on out, and how we tell people, and how people think. Is my <laughs> saying, you know, no free will. They just go ballistic, <laughs> ballistic, <laughs> screaming, shouting in my face, calling me all kinds of names on Facebook. <laughs> I changed my mind, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, YouTube, everything else, just never ending. Just, it's impossible to praise about it. But the science is there. It's a question of whether you want to believe it or not. How do you convince people to be okay with, with believing or not believing? Can you define free will just for purposes of this conversation? Well, free, free will, uh, for most people, is do I have a conscious choice for what I'm going to do? Now, my latest blog post, 99% of what we do is non-consciously done by this massive offline parallel processor elephant. And this little tiny thing up on top of the elephant believes it's in control making these choices. But it isn't conscious of almost anything that happens. Do you think if you had to use your free will to do this thing, you'd never move your hand? Your hand moves fantastically elaborately all by itself. And your life does the same thing. You walk down the stairs, you meet people, you talk, your thoughts come out of no place, your speech comes out, you don't think of your speech ahead of time. You're in control of almost nothing. What's left over after you abstract all of those things is the tiniest of possibilities. It's minuscule compared to what your non-conscious mind thinks good. This is not called the neuroscience. It's not philosophy. It's called the neuroscience. So there's just the tiniest thing you can possibly do. It's just non it's not conscious of anything else that goes on. And if you look at instances where 
something that we would associate with being, in fact, the deepest evil, the greatest atrocities that are carried out. They're carried out precisely in the experience of having free will, the insistence on having free will, the insistence that one's agency is the center of the universe. There is no more violent locus in contemporary society than that insistence. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think we just ought to remember that when we think like, when we hear like, we don't need any ethics, that it may in fact be that part of what we're sick with is morals and ethics, that somebody else ought to be some way, and I'm going to enforce that with my free will. Well, the reason I ask it that way is because I wanted to hear your definition. What sounds like you're saying, if I'm to iterate it back, is that you're defining free will as I am making a decision. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Consciously. Right. Yeah. Consciously, right. So yeah. I'm saying I from up here at the right level. Correct. Yeah. So then, in terms of this concept of agency, choice, and free will, what is your thought on on agency, choice, and free will coming from the deeper, more authentic, or you could say offline, from the elephant kind of thing? Uh, are there choices being made, or are there no choices? Because we're talking about it in a language where we can say, if I stand there naked in front of a dresser for a certain amount of time, I can indulge in stuff from here, or I can allow this to come through. Well, is, there, is there a choice that's made? The offline, the brain makes choices. The brain makes bazillion choices. We even know how it does it, how it cues them up, how it takes the alternatives and ways it knits each other, gathers data, reaches a certain saturation point, flips over and makes this choice. There's lots of choices being made. They're made all day long. Do I go down the stairs, across the hall? Do I drink this? Do I eat that? The brain makes bazillion choices. A day. We're just not conscious of it. The choice gets made. It ain't us doing it.